This is the solutions for the study guide for algebra, study guide number, quiz number nine. So let's take a look at the first type of problem. It says identify the domain and range of the relation below, then explain whether the relation is a function. So we have to take a look at the values that they're giving us, and they're giving us these ordered pairs. So remember, the ordered pairs go in alphabetical order. We've got x comma y, and so when I take a look at the first one, I can list the domains. And again, domains represent the x value, and the y value is the range values. And so all I'm going to do is list those. So the domains are, and we've got 3, 3, 3, 4, and 5. So basically 3, 4, and 5. Those are the different types of domains I see. Where the range values, so taking a look at those, I've got 7, 8, negative 2, 2, and 8. So I'm going to just list them in, uh, in numerical order. So I've got negative 2, 2, and I've got a 7 and an 8. So then they ask, well, is the relation a function? And I would say the relation is not a function. The relation is not a function because the domain, the domain 3. 3 is the one that repeats here. So 3, you can see how many different 3's we have because the domain 3 has multiple multiple ranges. So you can only have one range with a domain So you, in order for it to be a function. And so since the domain 3 has different values each time, when I went ahead and plugged them in, that means it's not a function. So here they say draw discrete Draw a discrete relation that is not, not a function. So discrete mean just, just means points. So you're going to have points just variously spread apart. But then you need two that are in line with each other for it not to be a function. So right here you can see how these two points are in line. So this one domain here, this domain at positive 1, has two different range values. So it's not a function. Not a function because, and in my case, it's because the domain, the domain one has two ranges. Another way to state this, since we've got a relation that, that's in graphical form, is you can use the vertical line test, and it fails. It fails the vertical, vertical line test. And that's just when you run a vertical line through the graph and it crosses in two points like it does here, then it fails that line test because that is a domain and that domain has more than one range. Well, here they want us to do a continuous or draw a continuous relation that is a function. This time it is a function. So we're going to go ahead and just draw any kind of function. It doesn't really matter. You could draw a line. You could draw a parabola. It doesn't really matter as long as you do it and it ends up passing that vertical line test. So these vertical lines I'm passing through are just tests. And you see how each of those vertical lines only crosses at one spot along my relation. And so we could say the relation is a function, a function because each domain each domain has one range. So that's the generic form of determining whether or stating whether it's a function. Or you could say that it passes the vertical line test. So that is another way. So, or uh, it passes the vertical line test. So let's take a look at the next type of problem that we'll see. And here it says a subway pass. A subway pass has a starting value of $100. And then it says after one ride, the value of the pass is 98.25. So it starts at $100. So we haven't used any passes yet. So these are the uh, number of passes we use here. Zero passes, it's $100 is the value. And from there, we change the value by 
uh, doing an operation. So let's see what it is. So the first iteration, we have 98.25. And then after that, our second pass that we buy is 96.5. And then that's what's left on the, on the card. And then after the third pass, it's 94.75. And what we'll end up noticing is that every time, this is going down by a certain amount. In this case, we decrease by $1.75 each time. So it looks like we're getting the same pass every single time. So assuming that things don't change, let's see what ends up happening in the situation. So they want to know, we want to write an explicit formula. So the explicit formula goes this way. It goes A of N equals a of 1, the first value, so whatever the first value is, plus, and then we've got our, our slope, or our rate of change. I'm going to use the variable, I guess, d for difference. And then that is being multiplied by n minus 1. So this is our general formula. So the first iteration is what we're looking for here. And that first iteration, after we've used the, the uh, pass. After we bought the $100 pass, we have 98.25. So when we write the explicit formula, we're going to start with the first amount, or the, in this case, the first ride after we uh, used it one time, 98.25, and then plus, and then our common difference is 1.75. And then we multiply that by n minus 1, so the number of rides minus 1. And it makes sense because if we had just the first ride, the first ride here, if I just put 1 in place of n, that would cancel out and I'd be left with the 98.25. So it definitely makes sense. If I had two rides, 2 minus 1 would end up being uh, just 1. 1 times negative 1.75 would take 1.75 away from that. So that's the first part. Now it, we want to predict what's left over after 15 rides. Well, we're just going to take... 15 and substitute. So we still use our original number there, 98.25, plus negative 1.75 multiplied by 15 minus 1. So this gives us 14, and we need to multiply that by negative 1.75. And then we take that value, which will be negative, and subtract it from the original, or the, after the first iteration. So let's see what we end up coming up with there. So we'll go ahead and do 1.75, and we're going to multiply that by 14, and that gives us 24.5. So negative 24.5 is what we have to take away from 98.25. So we'll go ahead and do that subtraction. So 98.25 minus, and then I'm going to take away the 24.5, and that gives me 73.75. So $73.75 is the amount left over after 15 rides. So let's take a look at the next one. It says the amount C in dollars is proportional to the number of hours you work. So C is proportional to the number of hours worked. So that means this would be our formula. So a proportional relation always has the formula Y equals MX. Or sometimes we ended up using Y equals KX for a, a constant of variation. They call this either a proportional relation or direct variation. So this is the, the formula that you would use if your relation is proportional or a direct variation. So again, we could end up using the words direct variation. And so from here, what they're going to want to do is you want to write the equation first. And so we're going to find out what the M value is. Well, it tells us the cost, or the amount of earnings was $54, and our number of hours was 6 hours. So you can see, you just divide by 6, and that tells us our hourly rate. And so that was $9 for every hour, is what that is. And so that equals M. And so we can write the equation as C equals 9H. And so that is the formula we wrote the equation, now we'd have to interpret the slope. So the slope, we'll say, actually, I'll add in the, the slope is 9, or 9 to 1, and when I relate that, it just means whatever's on top of the fraction. So on top of the fraction is dollars. It means we, which means, we'll say, which means, 
uh, you earn you earn nine dollars each hour. So that is the interpretation of the slope. Now they ask us to find the amount earned after 40 hours. Well, that's just C equals 9 times by 40. So I multiply those, I get $360 is the amount I earned. So the next one says Ed works 40 hours in 5 days. Sue works Monday through Friday, and here's the table of her hours. In the same coordinate plane, label the axis and graph the equation. Okay, so x-axis. Now the days are the hours worked... Uh, does not affect the days. The days uh, affects the hours that you end up working. So if I only work two days, then if I only am there for two days, I only work 14 hours. That's what Sue does. If, if she goes three days, then she has 21. So the number of days that you actually show up, that's the number of hours you're going to end up working. So we're going to put days in the on the x-axis, and I'm going to put hours along the y-axis here. And so I'm going to go ahead and give it some numbers. Why don't we just go up by ones here? So this is two, four, six, and so on. And it looks like I might end up going up by fives here. So this will be five, ten, fifteen, twenty. Oops, this is twenty. Uh, Twenty-five, thirty, and so on. This will be forty here. So now I'll go ahead and plot some points. So for Ed. He works 40 hours in 5 days. Okay, so 5 days, 40 hours. That would put him right up there. At 0 days, he works 0 hours. And that would make sense. So this is his line. And let's write down Ed alongside this line so we know that's Ed's line. Now, Sue works 1 day, 7 hours. Okay, so 1 day, 7 hours, somewhere down in here. Let's go to a one that we can fit on there. 3 days, 21. So 21 Three days, it's going to be just a little bit over right there. And 14 hours for two days, so it's a little bit under this line right about here. And so this one's going to be about there. And if we go to five days, five, if we go ahead and extend this formula out, it's going to be 28. So four, 28, five would end up being at 35. So that's when I can fit on my graph. So 5, 35 would be right there. So you can definitely see how Sue's line's underneath Ed's line here. So that's what it looks like. And so there's Sue. And so what we need to do is we need to uh, interpret what's going on. So we've now graphed it. We've labeled the coordinate planes. We've labeled the axes. We've done this stuff here. Who works more hours per week? So we would say Ed works more hours hours each week and of course now we're going to have to explain why and say his line his line is steeper which means uh, his slope is greater. And that's what I'm looking for because I want you to compare the the slope and the steepness or say something about the steepness of the line. That's what it says here. Compare the steepnesses of the graph. Well, Ed's is steeper than Sue's, which means his slope is greater and he ends up working more hours. And so that's the reason why he works more hours is because his hourly rate is more. He works uh, eight hours per five days if we do that division. So we find out what that that is 40 over 5 is 8 hours, or 8 uh, hours per day. And we see that Sue's only at 7 hours per day. So the slope of the line will give that away about uh, how many hours each day she ends up working or he ends up working. So let's take a look at the next problem. It says find the slope of the y and the y-intercept of the graph. So the y-intercept is our b term and that is negative four and our slope represents our m term and that is positive two which is the same thing as two over one so remember our general form for slope intercept form is y equals mx plus b and we can use that 
uh, because y is by itself. So negative 4, we go down 4 spaces, 1, 2, 3, 4, put the dot, and then use the slope. So up 2 over 1 each time, up 2 over 1 to the right, and that gets us a bunch of points that we can plot and draw a line through. So looking at the next one, they want us to write an equation in slope-intercept form. So let's try to find the y-intercept. In this case, they give it to me. It looks like it's right there at positive 3. And let's see if we can find the slope. So we look down, and it looks like it crosses here, here, and up here. So that's going down 1 over 2. Down 1 over 2. Down 1 to the right 2. So our slope is negative 1 to 2. So we can just write it in that slope-intercept form by just substituting in the variables that we have. So we know the slope is negative 1 half, and the y-intercept was positive 3. So that would be our equation, y equals negative 1 half x plus 3. So here it says to write the equation in slope-intercept form. So let's go ahead and just rewrite it down here. And I'm going to take away the 2x first from both sides. I'm left with 3y equals negative 2x plus 9. And I'll divide by 3. Now you have to divide every term by 3, including that 2, so that negative 2. So try write that as just a fraction, because the slope is the rise over the run. And go ahead and plot it. So we're going to go ahead and plot the y-intercept at 3. It's up 3 spaces. And then use the slope. The slope represents negative 2 to 3. So down 2, 3 to the right. Down 2, 3 to the right. And if I can't run, if I run out of room that way, I could always go up to 3 to the left. And you see how that gets me on that same line. So those are the problems that you'll see on the study guide and what the test will look like as well. Good luck.